I, uh, <laughs> had to do that part. So yeah, now we are recording. Sorry, thanks for reminding me. Sure. Uh, so I'd like to tell you today about uh, joint work with uh, Alexander Magazinov um, the, uh, on the uh, fluctuations of uh, random surfaces. Let me start with a more familiar object, uh, random walks. I, I hope that everyone in the audience knows random walks, but I'll briefly uh, mention. Uh, the talk, by the way, is a gentle uh, introduction to random surfaces, uh, as well as some elements of the proof. Uh, please feel free to ask uh, any question that you have. Uh, so a random walk uh, is the process uh, Sn, which is just a sum of uh, IAD, independent identically distributed, real random variables, and I'd like to think of it as a function. Here you see a function with linear interpolation between the points. Um, <clears throat> and uh, note that because the random variables are independent and identically distributed, if the uh, increment x has a density, then the whole random walk has a density, and that density takes a product form you take rho of the uh, gradient, Sn minus uh, Sn minus 1. So uh, we will later generalize this density formula. Now, uh, as uh, most of you, I hope, know, uh, the random walk has a uh, universal properties. If you assume only that the uh, increment distribution has zero mean and unit variance, then already you can deduce that the scaling limit of the random walk is a Brownian motion. And uh, what will be relevant for my talk, the fluctuations of the endpoint. So you, you look at the last point in the random walk and you ask, where is it? Uh, you started at zero, where did you end? And uh, the answer is that it fluctuates on order square root n. Moreover, it is Gaussian, uh, almost approximately Gaussian by the central limit theorem. But what will be relevant for me is that it fluctuates on the order of square root n. And similarly, the maximum of the entire walk also has the order square root n, and these properties are universal as described. We investigate in this talk higher dimensional analogs of random walk. What does higher dimensional mean? One possibility is to say that the walk takes its values in Rd, but this will not be what I will say. So I still take the walk to take values in R, so the other possibility, which is what I will do, is that the time, not the space, the time will be d-dimensional. So actually, instead of considering a function on the one-dimensional interval, I'd like to consider a function on a two-dimensional square or on a three-dimensional cube and so on. So here is, the, uh, here is a picture of what you might expect. This is a picture of the two-dimensional Gaussian free field. They took it from the website of uh, Jacopo Borga. Um, and uh, perhaps you've already seen the Gaussian free field, but actually I will not investigate specifically the Gaussian free field, but the more general object as you will see. But this is roughly what you may expect. So, okay, so what will I investigate? The object is called the uh, random surfaces, and here is the definition. Uh, by the way, it has some other names, ginzburg landau model, grad phi interface models, but I will just call it random surfaces, it is not so much connected to the random surfaces that are investigated in other works like uh, random triangulations or things of that nature. This is something else. So to define the model, you need the uh, three things. You need a graph that you can work on, a finite connected graph G, and that graph has a boundary subset. Boundary just means a subset, a distinguished subset, V naught. You need boundary condition, which means some values that you assign to the boundary subset. Usually in my talk, it will always be zero. I'll just assign the value zero to the boundary. That will be the choice usually. And what is the most relevant for my talk is this idea of potential. The potential measures, uh, similarly to the random walk where you had increments, the, the random variable x1 was what you added at each step. And the density of x1 rho controlled the density of the process. Similarly, here we will have this potential. It is analogous to the distribution of one step of the random walk in the earlier picture. So the potential is just a function taking values in minus infinity, infinity. It could be equal to infinity. That would be um, some uh, case that sometimes people consider. And the only thing I ask about it is that it's an even function. So uh, to go up and to go down, 
is the same with this potential. And then what is a random surface? A random surface is a probability measure on functions on my graph, like we had before the Gaussian free field. It's a probability measure on such height functions. It equals the boundary values on the boundary set, and it has a density. And the density has the product form, e to the minus, sum over all the edges in my graph of this potential u applied to the gradient of the function. Uh, this was not the reaction I expected from it. Let me erase. Um, <clears throat> so the potential u is applied to the gradient. So again, let us compare it with what we had for random walks. In random walks, we had um, rho, which was applied to, to the gradients of the random walk, to Sn minus Sn minus 1, S2 minus S1, and so on. So the analog of rho is e to the minus u. So e to the minus u will now be applied to the gradients of the random surface. But because it's, a, say, a two-dimensional grid instead of one dimension, then these gradients will not be independent anymore because um, they will satisfy the constraint that the sum of gradients on any cycle of the graph is zero. So although the density is a product form, the overall distribution is not a product uh, distribution of the gradients because of this constraint on any cycle. So this is, the, um, this is the definition of the random surface model. And you, you can think of it, penalizes the gradients. If you, uh, if you want to go up very much on an edge, you pay a certain amount for that. For instance, you can take the case u of x equal x squared. This is a standard case, and that will yield the so-called uh, Gaussian free field in the graph. And that means that if uh, a certain gradient is 7, then you pay uh, 49 for that in the density. But you can also consider other cases. You can consider, say, u of x being another different power of x, maybe x to the 4. And that would be a similarly defined model, but with a different definition. And you may expect them to be similar in many ways. I should say that the Gaussian free field is, um, is well understood, well studied, especially so because it has a Gaussian distribution. If u of x is x squared, then everything is Gaussian. Any other choice of u will not lead to a Gaussian distribution, and usually that makes it harder. Um, the motivation for studying such objects is that there are, first of all, natural examples of uh, statistical physics models like the Ising model or Potts model, but this time not having values in a discrete set, but rather in a, uh, in a uh, non-compact set, in the real line. They take values in the reals. So this is the maybe easiest example of such idea. And sometimes people use them to model, indeed, the surfaces that separate two things, uh, the interfaces in spin models. For instance, the interface between plus and minus in an easing model at low temperature in the Bruchin boundary condition. OK, this is the definition of the random surface model that we will talk about for the whole talk. Um, where, what will be the graph that we will take? What is most interesting for us is to focus on the ZD setting, so-called. So we will work with um, two possibilities. Either the graph will be a discrete torus in d dimensions. Here you have a picture of the discrete torus in two dimensions. So it will have the uh, vertices from minus L to L, but I make it so that the side length is even. So I start from L plus one and end at L. And the boundary set will be just some point, some arbitrary point, I call it zero uh, in the middle. Uh, and then I normalize the value of the height to be zero there. I have to normalize, by the way, because otherwise the um, previous density formula is not integrable. I cannot integrate if I don't fix the value at one or more points. And another possibility is to take the graph to be a d-dimensional discrete cube, and then uh, say one up to L to the d, and, uh, and I normalize on the boundary. So I make the heights uh, zero on every boundary vertex, if this is my choice. OK, um, so these will be the two settings we will consider. If you use this definition in one dimension, then you go back to the random walk that we discussed earlier. You obtain a random walk bridge. And for that reason, we would like to study the two-dimensional or higher dimensional case. This is the object of study. OK, what do we want to study about this object? 
So as I said earlier, the Gaussian free field can be analyzed in great depth. It has this potential X squared, and the fact that it's Gaussian allows you to study many things. But um, you remember from random walks that the properties are universal. In the case of random walks, you have a Brownian motion scaling limit. The fluctuations are always of a size uh, square root n. What I would like to understand is the dependence of the behavior of a random surface on the potential u, because the potential u takes the, um, takes the role of the density rho of, of one step of the random walk. For random walks, it didn't matter which density you had, so long as it had mean zero and variance one. I'd like to do the same here for random surfaces to say that the properties do not depend on u. This is the idea of universality, which I would like to study. So to what extent do the properties hold for a wide class of potentials as in dimension one? This is the object. Um, there are several things you may ask. You may ask about the so-called scaling limit. I will not go into it in detail, so if you don't know what it is, don't worry. But uh, let me just say that the scaling limit of the Gaussian free field, the, the case u of x equal x squared, is the so-called continuum Gaussian free field, a very important object. Um, and it is predicted that this continuum Gaussian free field is the scaling limit no matter what u you have or in great generality. However, people don't know how to prove this. Uh, the state of the art is that if the potential u is twice continuously differentiable and the second derivative is both bounded from zero and from infinity, then people know how to show it goes to the continuum Gaussian free field. Note that this condition says that in some sense, it's not that far from being x squared. x squared, of course, has the property that u prime prime x is constant. So this is a certain similarity to x squared. People would like to extend this beyond. They have managed. Some perturbations are known. And the case that e to the minus u is an average of e to the minus x squared is also understood. There are many names associated to these theorems, uh, Bridges, Yao, Nadav Spencer, Giacomino Rashpon, Miller, Adams, Bisco, Buchholz, Kutar, Deutschel, Hilger, Kotetsky, who's in the audience, say so, Muller, Spon, and E, for instance. And I hope I may have forgotten some people, and I apologize. Um, but in this talk, we will not talk about the scaling limit. We will talk about something more basic. We want only to understand the fluctuations of individual heights. What do I mean by that? Um, for instance, I go back to the graph that we had before. I only want to understand the height in the center. Just one height. I don't want to talk about the whole scaling limit. In fact, these are not, they're a bit of orthogonal questions, but in any case, this is what I would like to understand. In, in one dimensions, in the case of random walks, we know that the heights look like square root of n. I'd like to know what they look like on these uh, higher dimensional graphs. And we would like to consider both the typical height, meaning, uh, say, the variance, and the large deviation, meaning the tail probability, and how they depend on the potential and the dimension. These are the two parameters. Uh, as, as the graph goes to infinity, so a third parameter is the side length of, the, uh, of these uh, torus graphs or cube graphs. OK. And when you start to consider these questions, the first thing you ask about is the so-called localization and delocalization question. And this was pioneered by Braskamp, Lieb, and Leibovitch in 1975. <clears throat> they conjectured the following. <clears throat> they didn't want to take any potential. It's unclear. Also, in one dimension, you need to ask that there is variance, uh, variance one. It's unclear whether you can take just any potential or you need to make some assumption. So they made an assumption. They said the potential grows not too slowly at infinity. It doesn't look like logarithm. But any of the examples I mentioned earlier will be OK. The x squared, the different powers of x, double well potentials, the so-called hammock potential when it's infinity at some point. And anything you think about almost will satisfy this. Um, and then they said, if you take the random surface model with the potential u on the cube graph, uh, we will later consider the torus graph. They talked about the cube graph. I, I, this is not supposed to matter. Then, if you consider how big the function is, not the maximum, rather you take the fluctuation of the function, the variance, on the worst vertex, and no matter how big your graph is, 
The conjecture is that in three dimensions, the surface stays with bounded heights typically. So you take the height in the center of the cube, that height does not become larger and larger as you take the cube graph larger and larger. The height remains bounded. This is very much different from the one dimensional case, the random walk, where we know that if you take a bigger and bigger interval, then the height in the center will grow like square root of the length of the interval typically. Here, it stays bounded. The fact that it's three dimensions is important. This is called the localization phenomenon. On the other hand, if you do it in two dimensions, then like in one dimension, it delocalizes, meaning the variance goes to infinity. And it is further predicted that in two dimensions, this was not part of the conjecture, but it's predicted that it grows like logarithm of the size of the box, the square that you're looking at. This is the conjecture. This is the expectation. This is also what happens for the Gaussian free field. But we want to know that it happens for any U, so that there is this universality, which was explained previously. What is known about these conjectures? Well, in two dimensions, you want to show that it goes to infinity, and this is actually pretty well understood. So-called Mermin-Wagner type arguments. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have heard of this before, I will not go into it, but so-called arguments of Mermin-Wagner type have proved the logarithmic divergence in two dimensions. So they show that it goes to infinity and furthermore quantify the rate at which it goes to infinity for many, many potentials, in particular, all C2 potentials. So even going beyond the conjecture, actually, it doesn't even have to be, uh, well, it needs to decay in some way, otherwise the model is not well defined, but some decay and, and any regularity, for instance. So, it can, in some aspects, it goes beyond the conjecture even. And this is in the work of, the original work of Braskem Plibovic, the Brushin, Freulich, uh, Dima Joffe, Piotr Miłosz, myself, uh, Charles Pfister, Senja Schlossman, Yvon Velenik, and others probably that I forgot. Um, and I'm sorry, I apologize very much. In contrast, the localization problem, to show that the variance does not diverge in three dimensions, it appears to be harder. It's known in fewer cases. But by the way, this is, an, this is one of those instances of so-called continuous symmetry breaking in statistical physics, because localization means that although the system, the energy does not change if you add a constant to the entire surface, still um, in some limit, you remember the boundary condition. The boundary condition can set a typical height. So it is a type of continuous symmetry breaking. And, and these are known to be difficult, or at least uh, so far the experience shows them to be difficult. Indeed, it's not understood so well, this part, the fact that it's less than infinity in dimensions greater or equal to three, mainly known when the potential is twice differentiable and the infimum of it is greater than zero. And this was already in the original work of 1975 of braskem plib Libovich using the so-called braskem plib concentration inequality. So, and in particular, one case, which just seems a little bit beyond the Gaussian free field. Gaussian free field is u of x equal x squared. One case which is a bit beyond is the case x to the four, and even that case is not understood. And by the way, if you think about it, x to the four means that if you have a gradient of seven, you pay not the square of that, you pay the fourth power of it. So it's even harder to have big gradients. So intuitively speaking, you may say it's even harder to fluctuate. So it seems like there should be comparison, but no such comparison is known. In particular, this has not, not been proved. So the results I would like to tell you go in this direction. So we go beyond the, the state of the art. And I should say that this is what is mainly known but there are other works, so I'm sorry that I didn't list everyone here, but the other works work as well um, under similar, some perturbations of this condition are known and the case of average of Gaussian functions is also known. Okay, so I go on. And this is the first result I'd like to present to you. And this is, as I said, joint work with Alexander Magazinov. Take a potential, which is convex, and the second derivative is greater than zero, as we had before, but not necessarily everywhere, rather almost everywhere. 
almost everywhere. So in particular, you may take the family of potentials u of x equal x to the p for any p greater than one, in particular x to the four that I just mentioned. So the result covers these cases. And then the result says that if you work on the torus, on the uh, torus of side lengths to L, then in three dimensions, indeed, the variance is bounded like the conjecture. And in two dimensions, it's no more than logarithm, like the extension of the conjecture that we said the variance should grow logarithmically. So this establishes the conjecture, roughly because this is the torus and not the cube, but the spirit of the conjecture, if you will. Um, for any convex potential whose second derivative is positive almost everywhere, it goes beyond what was known. Previously, one needed to know that the infimum of the second derivative is positive. Now I only need that it's positive almost everywhere. But it's important because it covers, for instance, these cases which were open since 1975 and mentioned by some people. In, say, for instance, you may see the survey of Velenik from 2001. Um, this is the result. And I would like in the late, later parts of the talk to explain to you the proof of this result or the idea of the proof of this result. Before that, I will explain several other results. If there are questions about the result, this might be a good time to ask. Are there questions? <clears throat> Uh, so far, no question in the chat, but uh, it's been a very... Yeah, I, I monitor the chat as well. All right. Ah, okay, okay. Good. So, yeah. okay, so I, I move on. Um, I would like to tell you about another result that we have. And this regards tail probability bounds. Once you know that the height in three dimensions is typically bounded, you may ask a further question. If I want the height to be big, how, what is the chance of that? How, what is the chance of a large deviation? And uh, indeed, this is a relevant question if you want to know, say, the maximum of the random surface. So you want to know who's the biggest height. So you can do a union bound. If you knew that the chance to be high is something, you can do a union bound and see if somebody reaches that height. And this is relevant also to the um, question of entropic repulsion. I will not go into this question if you don't know what it is. It's not important for us. Well, if the potential is convex, you have something automatic. And in our case, the potential is convex. You have something automatic. There is a theorem that says that if the um, potential is convex, well, first of all, you can see that the random surface measure is log concave. I will go into that later. And secondly, it implies that the distribution of a single element, phi of v, the height at v, is also log concave. I will go into that later. And it implies, once you know all that, that there is at least exponential decay, meaning that if you denote by sigma the standard deviation of the height, we, we prove it's constant in three dimensions, then the probability that it exceeds t is at least, at, at most, e to the minus t divided by that. Um, you may do better under the condition that was mentioned before, that the second derivative is bounded below, Another consequence of the Braskem-Pleb inequality is that the tail probabilities decay at least like a sub-Gaussian random variable, e to the minus t squared. This improves upon the previous one, but only under this condition. However, can, can it in fact decay even faster than that? So are there random surfaces which are, for which it is very hard to go up? This, by the way, would break the universality. So, this would mean that the universality does not hold for the maximum height, because uh, for Gaussian free field, the probability to deviate is this, and this dictates the maximum height. So can it be that sometimes it decays faster? And this question was discussed by Deutsch and uh, Jacobin in 2000. Um, and they noted that when the potential grows faster than quadratically at infinity, this, is, this may be the case, but they didn't know to show that it happens or to rule it out. And what I will describe next is that this actually happens. So sometimes the chance to be big is even smaller, meaning in particular that the maximum is smaller than for the Gaussian free field. I will discuss it now for potentials of the form absolute value x to the p plus x squared. The plus x squared is helpful because then this condition the infimum of second derivative is satisfied. 
So this is helpful, but it was not known before. Okay, and this is the result, the result, the second result with Alexander Magazino. You consider this potential as discussed on the uh, either the cube or the torus, you can consider either of them, then the probability to be big is very small. We are doing it in dimensions three and higher. If the dimension is smaller than the exponent, the exponent is at least p, at least two. If the dimension is smaller, it decays like e to the minus t to the exponent, uh, to the dimension, sorry. If it's greater than p, it decays like e to the minus t to the p. And at the marginal case, there is a logarithmic correction. Um, this is the result that we are able to prove. And the result is sharp. Um, if, the, um, if the dimension does not equal exactly p, then lower bounds of the same order were obtained by Deutsch and Jacobin in 2000. In fact, we think that their methods can also be used for the critical case d equal p, but we haven't written that down, we haven't done it. Um, so we think this is always the sharp rate of decay. Um, to our knowledge, this is the first published work where faster than sub-Gaussian decay appears, but we do know of an unpublished work where it was done as well before us by Emmanuel Milman and Sasha Sodin. They considered the case absolute value x to the p, but only in the regime d greater than p. Uh, our proof can also handle u of x equal absolute value x to the p in this regime. This is also possible from our work. But uh, in any case, uh, you also see here the nice uh, transition between several behaviors. OK, so this is the second result, which quantifies the large deviation probabilities of the field, at least for certain potentials in dimension three, it shows that these fluctuations are not universal. The large deviation probabilities are not universal. And uh, it seems to be the first published result that shows faster than sub-Gaussian decay. Okay, I would like now to change gears. Perhaps you've already uh, lost interest in random surfaces. The next two slides talk about something else. And uh, hopefully you can reconnect because, because it could also be of use in other research problems. So maybe before you switch, I had a question. Uh, yes. I thought, uh, can, can we understand the different exponents as uh, different strategies for? Yes, yes, like, yes. Like, you the G, like a pyramid or something? Yes, that's correct. So this, perhaps I should have said something. Indeed, uh, when, the, um, when the dimension is greater than P, so if you want to pull a certain point up, then usually you pull the entire surface up with you because the, the way the random surface is built is that you pay for big gradients. If the height at V is big, then usually it's a good idea to pull up another section of the surface with you and for each one you pull up, you will pay something and this contributes to the exponent. However, when the dimension is greater than P, it turns out that the best strategy is to leave everybody alone because there is too many of them and just to make one point go up. If one point goes up, you pay e to the minus u for that point, for the neighbors of that point, so it becomes e to the minus t to the p. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand, um, d is less than p, then it turns out that uh, one thing you could do is to go up somewhat, uh, not, not exactly linearly, I think, but roughly speaking, almost linearly maybe, uh, to go up to height uh, t and by small steps, steps of size uh, one, I think. I don't fully remember. I, I think just going up by steps of size one um, up to the vertex v, and this gives the exponent t to the d. In the critical case, you have to go in a way that is somewhat adapted to the potential and the geometry, so you don't go up by steps of size one, you do something more and smarter than that, and this gives this exponent. All right, so indeed you're correct. This entails the strategies, and these strategies were already in the lower bounds of Deutsch and Jacobin. They, as I said, they didn't do the critical case. Uh, they didn't consider it, but I imagine they could have. Okay, so I go further. Uh, so this slide is about something else. I put aside random surfaces for now, uh, and uh, indeed I tell you about something useful that could be useful in other projects and uh, worth knowing. I tell you what is a log concave distribution. 
So this is just a probability distribution on Rn. And what does it mean to be log concave? It has a density e to the minus f, where f is convex. This is the only, uh, the only assumption. Now you take a random vector with a log concave distribution, and you would like to study its concentration properties. You'd like to say that it is close to its expectation. Not exactly the vector, but some function of the vector, say a linear function of the vector. This will be what is interesting for us. Maybe the, the first coordinate of the vector, that would be a linear function. So uh, a, an important, very important result is the brascamp lieb concentration inequality. It says that if the, the variance of any linear function of the vector is bounded above, by a certain functional that you can try to calculate. This involves the Hessian matrix of the density F, of the logarithm of the density F. Uh, the Hessian matrix, meaning the, the matrix of second derivatives. Uh, this, of course, changes from point to point. So really, the Hessian is a function from Rn to matrices. And you need to measure how well invertible that is. For instance, if all its eigenvalues are bounded away from 0, would be in great shape. That would be a, a strongly convex function, and that would mean the variance of any linear function is bounded by a constant, by one over this uh, eigenvalue, minimal eigenvalue. Um, so this is the inequality. If you can, roughly speaking, if you control how convex f is, um, sorry, uh, if you control how well, uh, how convex F is, if it's well convex, if the second derivative matrix is bounded away from zero nicely, then you have the bound on the variance. It's a very important result. You can try to use it in any, any context where you see a log concave distribution, and it may be useful. Uh, what Braskamp and Lieb proved is also applying to nonlinear functions of X, but I only care about linear functions in this talk. Now I talk about random surfaces just for a minute, and I go back to these ideas in generality. You can apply this to random surfaces because the random surface measure, if you recall, the density was e to the minus u, and, and this was summed over all the edges. e to the minus sum over all the edges, u of the gradient. If u is convex, then also the sum over all the edges of u also leads you to a convex function f, so then it will allow you to, you will get a log concave distribution. This is if and only if. Um, so if you have a convex U, you may use the Braskamp Lib inequality. What happens is that the Hessian of F will be greater or equal to the uh, Laplacian matrix as a quadratic form with this proportionality constant, which is the infimum of the second derivative. So if the infimum of the second derivative is bounded from zero, you can use it, and you will. And the Laplacian is the derivative for the Gaussian free field, so this will enable a comparison with Gaussian free field. This is how, so far, the um, localization phenomena has been proved by comparison with Gaussian free field using the Braskamp Lieb concentration inequality. This is a very useful thing also for other purposes if you have a log concave region. Okay, another important result in the work with Magazino is the following. We are able to um, show a generalization, an extension of the Braskamp Lieb inequality. And this is the driving force behind our results. I will explain two versions that we have in our paper. And uh, they take a while to digest. We can try to get it. So you take a random vector with a log concave distribution with density e to the minus f. And again, I would like to consider a linear function of it. So I consider eta x. We have an extension of the Braskamp Lieb inequality, which says that the variance, previously it was bounded by the expectation of this quantity. And now it is not bounded just by the expectation, it is bounded by the median. When would that be a useful thing? Well, if, for instance, if the expectation is infinite, and this can happen, or if the expectation does not represent accurately the median. So this is an extension useful in those cases. And this is in great generality, any log concave distribution. This is an extension of the Braskamp Lieb inequality. Indeed, exactly the extension relevant for random surfaces, as you will see later. Um, 
So this is one possibility. The second possibility is a little harder to grasp because it involved this quantity d eta. Actually, you may think of this possibility as an infinitesimal version of this possibility, as you will see. But this is uh, very useful. So this, is, well, this quantity, d eta xt, is a measure of the convexity of S. We introduce a quantitative measure, which is different from the Hessian, but related. What is the measure? You ask how convex is f um, at the vector x. You, you remember f is a function in space, so at every, vert, at every point it has a different, different behavior. So at the point x, in the direction eta, to distance t. How does that manifest here? You take around x, here is x, here is a point in space x, you take two points around it in a certain direction, eta, and uh, at distance t from x in this direction, eta, and you compute this, uh, this difference. And this is a measure of how convex or something to do with the second derivative of f, if you will, at the point x to distance t um, in the direction, eta. This is how this is formed. The infimum over every pair of points whose average is x and whose distance from uh, one another in the direction eta is twice t. They are at t away from x in both directions. So this is something to understand. And once you have that, if you find that this measure of convexity is greater than some d, with probability at least three quarters, uh, you can do other numbers. Um, then the variance is bounded. The variance is bounded by ct, how far you needed to take t, and something to do with d, so a certain expression. It's not important to us what the expression is. In what way is this a useful extension of the Braskem plib inequality? As I said before, you don't have to have f con well convex everywhere at every point of space. It needs to be well convex in some sense. It needs to be a good convex function, but not everywhere. It just needs to do it at most points x according to the distribution of your vector capital X. So you, you see that encapsulated here. If it has good convexity properties at most points, then that's good enough. And this is in contrast to the Braskem plib inequality, which takes an expectation. So if you have many, even a small number of points which are bad, they could draw the expectation very high and the, maybe expectation will be infinite but not, say, the medium. Um, so this is also explained here. And th there is a further extension. They, there, I have some supplement slides, if uh, people ask about that, which of, this, uh, of this thing, which can be used to obtain tail bounds, but I will not, um, not get to them, probably. So these are the new concentration inequalities. In the remaining time, I would like to explain how you may use the new concentration inequality, especially this version, I will only discuss this version, for the application to random surfaces in order to prove the localization that I discussed earlier. So for the next three slides, I will talk about the proof, uh, if there are no questions at this point. I had, had a quick question, but maybe you, if you want to keep it for the end of the talk, feel free yeah, to Yeah, you can so. ask. If, if f is just a square function, yeah. then this d of t is like t square. Is yes. That right? So right. so it depends and, on t. And then and then if I plug in the in the ratio, like if I imagine t is small, it seems to be diverging as t becomes smaller and smaller. Is that? Uh, no, it it goes it goes to zero as t becomes. No, I mean in the ratio in the variance, like uh, ah, this t over one minus um, it's like t over d, and then it's like one over t. No. So you you will take t squared here. T is very small. So right, so the upper bound you obtain will be less useful. Useful upper bound. Okay. So in that case, it may be so a I good idea to take t the... equal one, for instance. Okay, okay. I cannot recover the infinitesimal one by. That's right. So uh, the Braskem plib type inequality manages to compensate for that. So this infinitesimal version is not proved as a corollary of the non-infinitesimal version, but just does something more elaborate. Ah, and there's also a question in the chat. Um, uh, right, Gabor, so I see, asks this, uh, if this is only for linear functions. So Gabor, yes, this is only for linear functions. 
we have not attempted to do nonlinear functions. The, the proof method in Ostrakopa lines are inequality, and we have seen other works, for instance, that of Bobkov and Ledoux, which manages to use Prokopa line during inequality and catch nonlinear function. So it is not impossible that there is extensions, but we don't know and we have not done it. All right. So, um, so this, uh, this is the new concentration inequality. And I would like in the next three slides to explain how you use it to prove the localization of random surfaces as discussed in the main theorems. Okay, so um, here goes. So what result will I try to prove to you? Um, I'll try to prove to you the following result. I take dimension three and higher. So the two dimensional case is similar, but I don't want to um, go into it. I mean, it's very similar, but just for simplicity, let me talk about three dimensions. So I sample uh, the random surface on the poles with the potential x to the four. Previously, I mentioned a, uh, uh, a more extended theorem, u is convex and the second derivative vanish is greater than zero almost everywhere. I just take one example because the idea is similar in other examples. So I take it on the torus and I will show to you that the, um, the variance is bounded, bounded by some constant in three dimensions in height. For this, I will use the non-infinitesimal version. That means the second of the previous two inequalities. I will use this inequality here. I will remind it in our setup. Okay, so let us consider first the set of all functions to be considered. Let me call it omega. This is all the functions on the torus which are zero at the origin, because this is what it means to be on the torus, that you're zero on the origin. You remember that's the boundary set. Let us fix a point V where I want to evaluate the variance. And let us write the density. Uh, as e to the minus f of psi. So the density, I will remind in the next slide, it's the sum over all edges, e to the minus the sum over all edges of the gradient of the surface to the fourth power, because u is four. So let me just call that e to the minus f. And then the previous quantitative measure of convexity becomes, I have to go over all pairs of functions, which are, th these are the inputs to psi, whose average is the function psi itself, and at the vertex v, they differ by t. B because uh, you see, uh, previously I applied the linear function. So the linear function now is gonna be just the evaluation function at v. That's the linear function. So that's why I can write psi plus v, psi minus v. Uh, this is just evaluation in the direction eta. And then this is as before, the average is psi, and I take this measure of convexity. So this is exactly the, um, what was there in the theorem. And if I want to get a constant upper bound from the previous theorem, then all it means is that there is some d and t, which depend only on the dimension, also on the potential, but the potential is fixed. Mm -hmm. So only on the dimension, such that the probability that this measure of convexity is greater than d is at least three quarters. This is exactly a consequence of the previous theorem, exactly what we had here and a consequence. Okay, so um, this is what we would like to do. So now I will present the main calculation, which does it. So before I go into that, let us again explain that the uh, omega is the set of all possible functions and that the density at a given psi is e to the minus f with f being the sum of all edges of the gradient of psi to the fourth power. I'd like you all to, remind, to remember this. Now, because I'm going to ask about the convexity properties of f, it makes sense to first ask about the convexity properties of the fourth power, because this will come up. So this is a simple calculation. You ask what is x to the four evaluated at a, at b, and at their average, and how do they behave together? You find that this difference it's a simple calculation. It's basically the difference of a minus b over two squared, unless you're close to zero. If, if you are, because we all know that the second derivative of x to the four vanishes at zero. So you don't expect it to look like a square around zero. What controls that is the average a plus b over two. This is the coefficient of a minus b squared. 
Okay, this is a simple calculation, and this is a greater or equal sign over two. Um, sorry. Uh, okay, so now let me go one step further, and this is uh, more complicated, as you see. Um, so I will go back to this in a minute. Let us start. I consider the quantity that I wish to bound below. This is the quantity introduced before. I consider all pairs of functions whose average is psi, and at the vertex v, they differ by 2t. This is what I consider. But what does it mean? f, the function f, I can apply, I have a formula for it. So let me apply this formula over here. And when I plug in the formula, I have a sum over all edges, and I have the gradient of psi plus to the fourth power, the gradient of psi minus to the fourth power, and the gradient of psi to the fourth power. So actually, I can, it is exactly this formula over here. So I plug in this formula. I'm going to plug in this greater or equal, um, plug it all the way over here. OK? And then this will enable me to write the 12. The factor 12 becomes a factor 6 because of the over 2. And I have a sum over all edges. What, what is this factor? This factor, let me try to do it in a different manner. This factor is this factor over here. Because the, um, because the average of psi plus and psi minus is psi. So when I average the gradient of psi plus with the gradient of psi minus, I just get the gradient of psi. So this factor is this factor. And this factor, psi plus minus psi minus, this is this factor. I just substituted. It may look difficult at this point, but I really just substituted the formula for f and this simple calculation here. That's all I did. It's, it's easy, just complicated on the slides. And now I'd like to get rid of this coefficient because what I really want is to have a square of a difference. This is a nicer quantity. How to get rid of the coefficient? This is the heart of the issue. Well, I define this graph, this subgraph, this is all the edges where the gradient of psi squared is larger than delta. And instead of taking a sum over all the edges, I'm going to take a sum only over the edges where the gradient of psi squared is greater than delta. And this will tell me that I can take a delta outside. And I remain with this restricted sum, but I got rid of this factor. So what was done in this second step is only to use this definition of e psi delta. That is all. Um, and the last step, well, now that I only depend on psi minus, my, psi plus minus psi minus, I can introduce a new name for this function. Psi plus minus psi minus divided by two, I call it chi. So um, maybe I write here chi is psi plus mm, minus psi minus divided by 2t, but yeah, by 2t. If I take this function, well, chi at v will be 1 because this difference was 2t. And, and then the infimum, you can see it no longer depends on psi, actually, except for this uh, set of edges. So it will just be the sum over the same set of edges, but now the gradient of chi, and I got a factor t squared outside because I divided by 2t. So this is equality. So there were only two inequalities. One uses this formula for x to the 4, and the other uses the definition. And what we see here in the last expression is the so-called uh, effective conductance between 0 and v in the subgraph e psi delta. And um, so, um, okay, th this, this is actually a well-known um, well quantity in graphs. Uh, this is the electrical resistance between zero and phi in this graph. It's one over because it's the conductance. But in any case, I will go back to that later. So what have we achieved? We see that the measure of convexity, the measure of convexity of the density F, at the point psi depends on the set of edges where the gradient of psi is small. 
if this set of edges is, is, not, is very, I mean, if there are not many edges where it's small, if at most edges the gradient is large, then this infimum will be a sum of almost over all the edges. In any case, it's a calculation. So what is the remaining goal? What we needed to show was that this measure of convexity is bounded below. Let me reformulate it now. We need to show that this expression that we obtain, that, that we can take some delta uh, such that this expression will be bounded below by some constant with probability at least three quarters. And, and actually the value of t does not matter. We can take t equal one. t will just be a factor outside. I take t equal one, but uh, the important thing is to choose delta sufficiently small so that this set of edges, ipsi delta will be almost everything as you will see. And then I will be able to prove such a lower bound because the infimum prefers to have more edges to play with. So this was the main calculation. I hope you managed to follow it. I'm sorry if uh, the notation is a bit difficult. Uh, it remains only one slide where I describe this, how we attain this goal. Okay. So uh, recap, we are talking about this potential and this random surface on the torus. And we, I define the effective conductance of a subset of edges E. The effective conductance of E is the infimum over all functions, which take the value zero and the value zero at zero and take the value one at V of the sum of the gradient square. This is the effective conductance between the origin and V. And we also have this set of edges, which is the set of edges where the gradient is bigger than delta. Again, phi is this random function. So this is a random set of edges. And the goal is to prove that when you use this set of edges in the effective conductance, you're bigger than C with probability at least three quarters when delta is small. Okay, now if the set of edges was everything, if you had the entire edge set of the d-dimensional torus at your disposal, then it is a standard fact that the effective conductance is bounded below. This is really the transience of ZD for d greater or equal to three. And we work here in dimension three. You already can see what will happen in dimension two. This will not be bounded below, but be bounded by something depending on the size of the torus. And you can translate that into a variance one. Benjamini and Cosma have proved that if E is not a, um, the whole edge set, but it is a suitably supercritical percolation, it needs to be anchored, anchored percolations, anchored. The isoperimetric profile of it needs to look well around zero and around V. So anchored isoperimetry is relevant. But if it is good enough, then uh, the effective conductance is also bounded below by a constant. In our paper with Magazino, we, we need the additional facts. We elaborate on this, but this basic result was already can be taken from Benjamin Cosma. Um, in any case, so we only need to show that this random set of edges where the gradient is bigger than delta is suitably supercritical with probability three quarters. Now, when, when is an edge not included? An edge is not included if the gradient is small. Now, if you think about it, you, you have a random surface. It is a fluctuative thing. You take a single edge. What is the chance that, th that this edge will be very, very flat, meaning the gradient on it is 0 0.000001? It should be a very small chance because why, sh why wouldn't the edge fluctuate a little? The only reason why it is, uh, I mean, typically speaking, uh, typically speaking, it will fluctuate a little because there is some entropy in the system. The only way it will not is if the neighbors somehow are at such a big angle that they manage to force it. I mean, you can think of unusual situations, but, but you think that this is very unlikely. So intuitively speaking, this set of edges should be pretty supercritical when delta is small, but this is not easy to prove. If you try to prove it uh, by hand, it, I don't think you will succeed. It's not obvious. And what we need for that, what we use is the so-called uh, chessboard estimate. If you don't know it, I will not go into it. We use reflection positivity uh, through vertices. Um, and this allows us to prove what we need. Uh, this is the only place in our proof where it is important to work on the torus. And it yields to us that the chance that the gradient is small at many edges 
is at most some small number raised to the power of the number of edges. And this is enough to show that it's really a supercritical, suitably supercritical population with chance three quarters. Um, this is what we have. Um, let me mention, I, I do have some work with the uh, Omri coin Alora that attempts to prove similar things without the chessboard estimate. It has partial progress in this direction. So it's really not obvious how you show that many edges are not simultaneously small. It's very intuitive, but not obvious. Okay, so this is the, the end of what I wanted to show. And what you can see in this proof, one thing you can see is that indeed, uh, you, we reduced it to this expression, the effective conductance, but it is possible that the effective conductance is not what we want. It's not bounded below. It is possible that this percolation is a bad percolation for us. It's not suitably supercritical. So it is important, what I said in the beginning, that our um, results only require high probability and not all the time. Indeed, if you just try the brascomb plib inequality as is, then in certain dimensions you will fail. No, not sure if you will fail exactly in dimension three and exactly for power four, but power 100 dimension three, I think will fail. Okay, so I finish. Um, what open questions may you ask? I just presented some small collection. I think uh, people can come up with additional ones. First of all, we haven't proved the brascomb plib libovich conjecture because they want a really large collection of potentials. And this is what you expect. If you consider random walks, then you have universality for any, almost any choice of potential. Why not here as well? And people expect it, I think. So, um, so this conjecture remains, and especially to go beyond convex potentials, because we still assume convexity. We actually have some work in progress going in this direction, but, um, but still, the, main, the big conjecture remains, and uh, even if we manage, we'll not uh, get the whole conjecture yet. So, but, but we do have some problems. Um, and next thing, uh, to take the actual scaling limit. This is not discussed in our work, um, but this is certainly of interest. A another thing which uh, not everyone um, is, is so familiar with is the idea of integer-valued surfaces. I defined my surfaces already in the very first uh, slide to take values in R and to have density. But you may think about random walks. The usual random walk people think about is the simple random walk. It takes values increments plus minus one. Can you do it for random surfaces? You can, in fact, you can talk about surfaces that take integer values. And in, in one dimension, they always behave the same. So you can ask, do, do they behave the same in two or three dimensions? Well, uh, not exactly the same, actually. Things are, some things are known to be different, but people do expect localization in dimension three, and delocalization in dimension two, if the temperature is high enough. So th there is something here. There's a roughening transition. You need to be careful, but generally Can we prove it? And the, the, the techniques that work for the real valued case don't immediately apply to the integer valued case. They're more analytic, they use the density, so new techniques or at least extensions are needed in that. And uh, lastly, which is uh, quite an interesting question, in dimension three, integer valued surfaces, even at low temperatures, even at high temperatures, so-called, are not exactly like the real valued one. They exhibit exponential decay of correlations no matter how high the temperature is. This is a result of Gupfert and Matt for the integer valued case. So what is the scaling limit in that case? I'm, I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure. I, I don't understand it well enough. I'm not sure people know what it should be. So there is something unclear for integer valued surfaces in 3D. So that's another question. And that's just a selection. You can think of other questions. Uh, I have two supplement slides. I don't think I have the time. Uh, you guys can. <laughs> we're, we're running a bit out of time yet. Sorry. <laughs> we, we are done or not done? And what is the. We're, we're, we're pretty much done. Okay. Yeah, I'm, yes, I'm pretty much pretty done. So I, right. Uh, this is really. We're, we're really done, actually. The existence of the slides is just to show you that the proof of the concentration inequality is not long. You can fit it in two slides daily. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Ron. So let me try to unmute, or at least give everyone the ability to unmute themselves and give you a round of applause. So I think you should be able to unmute yourself. So thank you very much.
in so just just in between the the two talks um life has texted me from his holiday to remind me to uh remind you